Greetings one and all, this is Lloyd Brown and welcome social media family to my vlog. The series that is Being Lloyd Brown, where I'm just letting you know who I am, who I was, who I need to be, where I was, where I am, where I'm going, where I need to be. Some of the contents of the video might be a tough listen for you, but it's the truth. Something I'm living with. So, whatever perception you have is the perception that you have. But my life does not live according to that. So, we are at episode eight. Episode eight. The US of A. The US of A. A territory that artists dream of cracking. A market that artists dream of cracking. It's like when you crack the United States of America, the simple sheer size of, of the country, you can just tour that piece of rock on its own. However, with their tough tax laws, where the government will take 30% of your shit I don't know if it's less than that now, but they got some strict tax laws. And as you've noticed with, with certain celebrities, actors, singers, them having tax problems and what have you, gives you an indication that the federal government do not play. They don't play. So, I made a commitment to try and raise my profile in the United States simply so that I can I can constantly tour the United States. Artists that I looked upon and saw had relative success as artists based in the UK was Pato Banton, Tipper Irie, Steel Pulse. Um, I don't think there was anybody else really on them levels and to some degree Maxi Priest um, but I wanted a piece of that action I didn't want to compete with nobody I just wanted to be on the same I wanted to be on the same train line I don't care if if they're in front or they're behind, I don't care. As long as I'm going, I'm making the same stops because, you know, nobody wants to see one reggae act every day for the rest of their lives. They want, they want some difference. So that was my logic in wanting to be part of the touring review as it were and to also represent the UK and to show my fellow peers in the UK that I'm doing something I'm trying to do something and they can do it too because in this industry I say industry in this fraternity there are a number of people who have toured all over the world and don't want you to have no links whatsoever. They don't want you to have no links whatsoever. They don't want you where they've been. They don't want you nowhere near them. And I don't know why, because if you look on the size of America, why, why would you think that your fan base is going to leave you for me when you've already trod the boards where you've needed to trod? The natural thing is, is, to, is to keep the thing turning. 
That's what Coxon done with his sound. Even though it's one Sir Coxon, he had, I think it was three sounds, and they called it, they, they, he called them all Sir Coxon, High Power, whatever, and they all toured around the island of Jamaica. It's the same, it's the same entity, but it's split up into different, en into multiple entities. That represents the same thing, Studio One Music. So with reggae music, it's no different. And that was my mindset. But in the entertainment business, you have bad mind. Dirty stinking bad mind artist that don't want you. But I wasn't phased by that. I was going to do what I was going to do. So um, I hooked up with a manager. And the thing about this individual was that she was the first person that put Luciano on the road in America. She got you. She got Luciano's first tour in America, and obviously he has not looked back since. So, someone who's got those capabilities, I want it in my corner. But prior to even that point. to the point of sleeping on people's sofas and sleeping on people's floors. I needed a band to work with. And I hooked up with a band called The Seventh Street Band. I thought they were a, you know, a hard working job in set of musicians. But then the buzz thing that was going on was, was like, well, what's Lloyd, what's Lloyd Brown doing with them? What's he doing with them? I don't know. I don't know who they were. I didn't know who they represented and what have you. And to a point, I mean, I didn't listen to that. I just, I put the work in, I put the grind in and it was working and it worked up to a certain point. But what I started beginning to know is not only from 7th Street Band, but subsequent bands I worked in America with was that at first it's like, oh, oh, Mr. Brown, it's, oh, it's such a pleasure. It's such a pleasure to work with you and, you know, Oh, you know, we've loved your music from this and that and blah, blah, blah. It goes from that to fuck you, pay me, right? So say, for example, I'm doing a gig, right? And between me and the band, we get paid, let's say $3,000, okay? We get paid $3,000. They would say, we want $2,900, Remember, it's going back from, oh, enough respect, Mr. Brown, blah, 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 to fuck you, pay me. And I went through four bands. I went through four bands like that. Four bands. I had big artists, big artists saying to me, Mr. Brown, come work with my band. And I'm saying, no, nah, I can't be doing that. I can't put that on your band. You, you know, you are an act within yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, you, I can't be doing that. Can't be doing that. It's like, thank you, give thanks, but I've got to do this shit on my own, of my own steam, on my own merit, with the people that I need to work with. And that's all I was basically going through. Then what basically topped it was... Well, let's put it in chronological order. Even when all that was basically going on, I had nothing to, to call my own in terms of a studio. So I've got to put my glasses on. Okay. I had nothing to call my own as a studio to basically record from because after making Deep and Against the Grain with Bitty, I still had all that production information in my head. But at that point, I needed equipment to basically to put that into fruition. So to cut a long story short in that regard, me and Bitty went to a store to get the equipment that I needed to record industry standard music. And it was like, it looked like a home studio and it was a home studio. But after seeing how Bitty worked, you know, my equipment was like a couple of tiers down from his equipment, but it's still done what it had to basically do. 
So I was happy with that. And all I was getting from people, I know studio that, man. I home studio that, man. Blah, blah, blah. Re, 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 re. I know studio that. A production suite that. I said, fine, cool, no problem. I'm in my lane. You stay in yours. And then I recorded Said and Done, which was my first album that I recorded for Rhythm Works Productions. Then I recorded Silver. I recorded the Silver album, which basically celebrated my 25 years in the music business. And Silver was a critically acclaimed album, critically acclaimed album. I had people come to me that I never thought would come to me and, and congratulate me on that album, you know, and they did. So in the meantime, I was doing that. And in the meantime of doing that, I'm in and out of America. And I'm trying to up my game by, by extending my umbrella of Rhythm Works Productions to um, music video recording and graphic designs and stuff like that. And it started with two cameras. One of the cameras that I'm actually looking in right now, which was the high definition camera of its age at that point in time. Now you've got 4K and all them cameras running about now, but this was like, this camera right now cost me 800 pound. So I bought two. And I had another camera, which, which, which was cobalt as it were, but that was standard definition. So by the time I got that camera, it was like, it was old. It was dead, you know, but anyway, in that time, I'm setting up rhythm works and I'm doing what I'm basically doing. So not only is the music coming out, but the videos are coming out and people can see me and hear me and I'm creating a present within the business, right? But people don't over the fact that to get all of that stuff done, it costs money. It costs money. And I was getting work. I was getting work. And I was just trying to maintain the family home in the process in a continually crumbling relationship. And the relationship didn't pan out the way it was supposed to pan out. It was just an on and off, on and off, on and off situation. But then going back to America now and working with the management that I had there and then a particular artist noticing that I'm in America and I'm raising my profile and that artist looking on me and thinking, raw, what a live brown I do out here? Raw, why Lloyd's Lloyd's playing in venues that I'm playing at? Raw, Lloyd's playing in festivals I'm playing at. Who's this person that's landing his business? So basically he got all up in a fear business and got her starstruck and basically was instrumental in fucking up my business basically and resulted in me not working in America after that me not wanting to work in America after that it wasn't a case where I couldn't work in America. I didn't want to work in America because what I was seeing in America was insidious and nasty. It was horrible in terms of the business, in terms of, oh, it was just horrible, nasty, nasty, you know, and it was all presenting, it was presenting an element of, Rastafari and love and peace and blessings and you know all of that but deep down you know the cogs the cogs of the of the gear the, the gears of the cogs were oiled in shit it was horrible and I just decided I don't want to work in America anymore I don't want to work in America anymore. I just felt 
I just saw so much corruption in it. And it all stemmed from that particular artist who I have to say I, I have no respect for. I'm not going to name the artist, but people who know me deep know the artist me I talk about. And that was another trauma for me. Yet again, I'm trying to make progress and I'm getting knocked back. Trying to make progress, getting knocked back. And what suffers at the end of the day? My relationships, the things that are supposed to ground me, they suffer. They suffer. So, from the silver out, from the said and done album, the silver album, I have literally made an album every year since then till now. I've made, I've made 11 albums in 12 years, 11. That's not normal, but it's what I did. Whereas I thought that I'm being productive. Yes, I was. Let's cut this video and we will carry on. Stay blessed, Magan.